Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 in our Dare to Teach series, uh, a series of comments actually to try to define the integral teacher. We are now working with the core concept of courage. Now our assumptions are that you've been with us at learnstrong.net down the left hand side. You found the playlist there that's the Dare to Teach playlist. You've worked with our two introductory set of comments or lectures and then you've worked with that first group of four um, from honesty and forgiveness um, to freedom and love compassion and then we're now in the second group we've already spoken about justice hope and now we're going to talk about courage before we finish that second group of four um, talking about joy and peace I'd, um, I'd like to begin our conversation about courage and uh, man oh man if there's anything teachers need today it's that I'd like to go back though I told you guys that uh, I'm, I'm a humanist and I lecture in the humanities and stories are what we are and the stories we tell uh, are, are by definition kind of who we are I'd like us to go back to November of 1920 a hundred years ago and the great prophet W.B. Yeats in his classic Second Coming I've given it learnstrong.net a full exegesis of this poem but I just like for us to get in our mind what it is that Yeats saw coming in the second coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loosened and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction. While the worst are full of passionate intensity. Now any number of us in the classroom have pointed out, whoa, that one, that one for sure hits very, very close to home. Uh, I like to say it this way, today it seems to me that teachers need courage more now than ever. But obviously the question is, well, what is courage? I, it, I always recommend to young teachers, they always ask me, what, what, what should I be reading? And I'll always say, you should pick up Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. Do you remember this line, let it be impossible, but do it? Um, I'm convinced this is one of the great novels and great texts of education and educational theory. Think of it this way. Our lives as teachers are in some ways bookend. Between on the one hand, Patience, wait, 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 where's the last lines from, uh, um, uh, from Longfellow's Psalm of Life? Um, Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait, that is to say patience. So on the one hand, man, it takes a lot of patience to do our job. On the other hand, bookended, on the other hand, passion. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. The enthusiasm, passion, passion, yes? Um, Courage, I argue, is the glue that kind of holds these two at times polar opposites together. Um, it, if you will, keeps things from falling apart, to use the line from uh, Second Coming. So what do I say to first-year teachers who are just starting this process? Well, the first thing I'll always say is you have no clue as you, as you enter classroom really what's happening. It takes you at least three years, some say five, to be able to actually figure out what's going on. Um, why? Because you have to try to learn the rhythms. We're going to have more to say about this later, but that's one of the biggest challenges as, a, as an early teacher. I've had people, who, uh, uh, colleagues of mine, who come in from the business world, from the medical world, from the research world, and they step into a high school, uh, public high school classroom or an elementary classroom. Oh my word, the amount of energy. It's absolute chaos. And so you got to learn the rhythms. And the best mantra early on to a first year teacher is always patience patience. <laughs> it'll, it'll come. It isn't going to happen. It isn't going to happen miraculously fast. It just isn't. And there's no gimmicks. This is why I've said before in some of these lectures, there's no gimmicks to be able to become the integral teacher. It is, it is hard, lifelong hard work to be able to figure out those rhythms. Why? Because everything is always changing. Um, and of course, the, re the, the reason why the mantra has to be patience is there's so much pleasure and pain that will happen in a classroom. The foundation then of courage is necessary or these two things of pleasure and pain are going to pull us apart with terrible energy loss. And as we go through the process of learning to be the integral teacher, we got to figure out that foundation of courage. The way I like to say it is this way. So I'll say it. To see 
both pleasure and pain as tools of training leads to a kind of contentment in the classroom. And that contentment is, in my estimation, the door to courage. Or to say it another way, courage is the acquired ability to ask the correct question when bad things happen in the classroom. Now we're to our, of our big five, uh, you'll remember epistemology, ontology, psychology, sociology. The last of the big five is theodicy. How do we deal with pain and suffering in this world? Now, I, was, uh, I, I, I once was approached by a student who was brought in from the outside. I believe it was from a pretty bad neighborhood in Los Angeles. And he just walked in and he said it immediately. I'm not going to do anything for you. They shipped me out here to the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. And I'm just telling you now, I'm not going to do anything for you. And I said, hey, that's fine. Um, why don't you do something for yourself? And if you just want to sit and listen, that'll be fine. And so he did. He was a great observer. And finally, we became uh, acquainted and began to have conversation. And I found out that he was, among all the other things that he had done in his life, he was a young graffiti artist. And he said, you know, I'd like to make a, I'd like to make a sign for you. And I, and I want to ask you, of all the stuff you've ever read, can you reduce it down to one line? And I'm going to put that on a, uh, I'm going to put that on a large piece of paper. I'm going to let you hang it in your room in 303. Well, I love questions like that. And I, and I, and I said, well, from everything I've read and studied, I can reduce it all down to a single line. And it is, in my estimation, the heart of courage. Because bad stuff is going to happen. It is my job as an instructor to let you know that. Um, the mantra, don't worry, be happy, is the mantra of a silly fool. Of course, of course uh, five-year-olds are happy playing next to a, a road with 18-wheelers. With uh, and they don't worry. But of course, we understand that without some instruction and responsible action, those young children will end up damaged. No question. The issue is always about what do you do when the bad stuff happens. Our tendency is to say, to think or to say out loud, no, why is this happening to me? Now that's a compelling question. It's a legitimate question. Let's say it out loud. It is the human question to ask, no way, why is this going to happen to me? Of course, if we analyze it at all in our mindfulness activities, <laughs> what happening to me as opposed to what happening to somebody else, right? And then immediately go, oh yeah, I guess that's kind of narcissistic and, uh, and selfish to think I wish this was happening to somebody else instead of to me. The Bodhisattva, of course, vow is I let it happen to me so that it doesn't have to happen to someone else. We think about, of course, uh, uh, Christ hanging on a cross. Forgive them for they know not what they do uh, as opposed to forgive them or don't forgive them because they're scumbag swine. No, 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 right? But Here's the insight that I wanted to help my young student, and, and obviously it's the challenge for me to help all of my students, and obviously now you guys as teachers. Think of it this way. When I ask, why did this happen to me? I am picturing myself as the victim in a universe where all this stuff just kind of randomly happens. Now, we're not denying that random poop happens in this world. No question about it. We're asking about the way we process the events of this world that are especially painful, dare we say it, evil, suffering, pain. Now, of course, we've given a whole lot of lectures on theodicy when we did our Milton's Paradise Lost. You can find all of those lectures, and I think as a practicing teacher, it makes a lot of sense to go and work through some of those classic texts, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. Of course, I always recommend Dante's Divine Comedy and Milton's Paradise Lost. Those should be standard texts for all of us as readers. Why? Because in every one of those texts, the question is, how do you deal with pain? How do you deal with suffering? To ask, why did this happen to me, posits that I am a victim sitting in a universe of all this stuff happening, and I have no control, I have no power. And, let's point it out, as I say to my students, there will never be a good enough answer to the question, why did this happen to me? Never is going to happen. Because any answer that's going to be given, I can always come back with another question like, well, yeah, but why? And on he goes. So the key, in my estimation, for courage is when we can learn, and I would underline that word if I was taking notes, because that's what it's going to take. Learn through the process of living life to ask a different question. We're going to change the two to a four, and we're going to ask, why did this happen for me? Now, i got to get this out of the way right away, because sometimes people will say, oh, you're just a blind optimist that want to try to see good in everything. No, 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 no. 
No, no, absolutely not. I was doing a gig uh, once in a fairly large group down in Houston, and I made this argument, and a woman actually challenged me in the middle of my in the middle of my talk. I can't believe you just said that because I was abused as a child. How dare you say that? I said, wait, wait, wait. I'm not arguing at all that we celebrate pain and suffering as somehow useful in, some, in the way that we would say we hope for it. We celebrate it. Yay, I, I have cancer and that's a good thing. No, 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 no. That is not at all what I'm saying. But I said to the young lady, I said, tragedies happen. And they are unexplainable. I'm not asking that question. I'm asking, though, was there ever an answer to the question, why did it happen to you, that you accepted? She said, no. I said, what is it that you now wish to do? She said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher and a therapist. I said, is it possible to argue that the terrible experience that you endured makes you a better teacher, helps you to be a better therapist? Because you've certainly been in circumstances that many other teachers have not, and therefore you're able to help children? Is that possible? We're not saying that we're celebrating pain and suffering. Yay, more pain and suffering. No, 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 no. And if we can avoid pain and suffering, we certainly will. No question. Right. But what we are going to say is the following. When it happens, and it will, to us as teachers in a classroom, do I have the courage to be able to ask the real question, what can I learn from this? What can I learn to speak in our Dante language through this. That, it seems to me, is the key. I love the work of the great religion scholar and theologian, Houston Smith. And in a conversation that he had with Bill Moyers that I very much recommend that you run to ground, he was talking about training with a Zen Roshi, and the Zen Roshi made this observation about what true life is all about. And when I heard him say it, I couldn't help but think, this should be the teacher's mantra. This should be, if you will, the teacher's prayer. It works like this. About everything that we do in our classroom and in our world and in our life, we should simply see it this way. Infinite gratitude for all things past. Infinite service to all things present. Infinite responsibility to all things future. And when I heard that, I thought, man, that's some profound wisdom for a teacher. Could we capture, could we have the courage? I like to say it this way, the teacher's got to dig a deep pool of courage and then drink from that pool daily. Because if we get away from that pool of courage, we're going to find ourselves asking questions like, why is this happening to me? We're going to begin to have short fuses. We're going to begin to have less and less energy. And of course, we will treat our students with less and less justice, respect. I like to think about the power of the model. Think of it this way. An old timer said to me early on, just watch and learn. Watch and learn, Junior, watch and learn. And from that I took tremendous uh, advice from him. Because there's two kinds of models. Yes, no question, the negative model. Early on I watched the real old timers that would sit, for example, in the teacher's lounge and run down other teachers and the administration and students and gossiping and saying negative things and always negative energy that, of course, spilled out into the classroom once those teachers re-entered. And I recognized early on, I definitely do not want to be that teacher. So models that are negative are incredibly powerful and we can learn from them. The positive models, of course, were teachers that took some new regulation that had been handed down, for example, and while everybody else was whining and complaining, they didn't. They didn't. They just went to work. And I noticed that kind of energy carried over the years them further, right? They refused to grow cynical, and they recognized that if they do grow cynical, their students see that and will internalize that kind of cynical attitude. And they're not going to be as effective, and to that degree they won't, they won't be free. I like to say it this way, teachers who possess the necessary creative energy to ask, why is this happening for me, can define the pain of their classroom, both for themselves and for their students, in some positive way. Then, and only then, can they ever experience joy, which will be our next topic. You'll understand, I hope, why I move from courage to joy, because you can't have joy without courage. Let's finish with a reading from the great Marcus Aurelius. I promised that we would be returning to uh, this great Stoic thinker. He wrote this in Book 5. In the morning, 
When thou risest unwillingly, let this thought be present. I am rising to the work of a human being. Why then am I dissatisfied if I'm going to do the things for which I exist and for which I was brought into the world? Or have I been made for this? To lie in the bedclothes and keep myself warm? <sighs> but this is more pleasant. Dost thou exist then to take thy pleasure and not at all for action or exertion? Dost thou not see the little plants, the little birds, the ants, the spiders, the bees, working together to put in order their several parts of the universe? And art thou unwilling to do the work of a human being? And dost thou not make haste to do that which is according to thy nature? But it is necessary to take rest also. It is necessary. However, nature has fixed bounds to this too. She has fixed bounds both to eating and drinking, and yet thou goest beyond these bounds beyond what is sufficient. Yet in thy acts it is not so, but thou stoppest short of what thou canst do. So thou lovest not thyself, for if thou didst, thou wouldst love thy nature and her will. Profound, profound wisdom. That dialogue that is had between ourselves and ourselves. Oh, I just love to sit back and we can't be lazy. That's the key. And it takes courage for us, now to our big five, to ask, can I show courage through my epistemological position? That is to say, can I accept the moments when I could be wrong and when somebody else is right? And do I have the humility and the respect to say, you know what, you're right, I was wrong. And I saw things the wrong way. How about ontologically? Can I balance body, mind, spirit? Do I have the courage to do that? Or am I out of balance? How about... Courage as it relates to psychology and facing fears. What are my fears? And can I face those fears? Do I have the ability to practice courage sociologically? So, for example, can I respect alternate views, especially views that I don't agree with, so that when an administrator or a colleague is going to say something to me that immediately, instinctively, I want to respond negatively to, can I back away a bit and say, i gotta, I got to hear this out? That's the only way, by the way, that professional learning communities will ever exist, is if we have the courage to be able to respect each other's alternate views. And then, of course, finally, the theodicy question is this. Can I, can I find the courage to finally ask, why did this happen for me? And thereby find the joy that we're, we're about to turn to in a moment. I dare you to practice courage, since this is the Dare to Teach series. I dare you to practice courage. In your teacher's learning journals, I challenge you to think about a time when you did practice courage. And for that, you give yourself a big high five. Man, it took a lot of courage for me to get through that. But of course, what was a time when you failed, when you didn't? And can you learn from that as we're arguing? That takes the courage to be able to face, face those realities. And then and only then can you practice with joy. And that's our, that's our next topic. Thank you.